Good afternoon or evening, everybody, uh, from a very wet and grey London. Uh, but a very warm welcome to you all to the third in our series of webinars brought to you by the Commonwealth Heritage Forum. Now, I'm Philip Davis, I'm the chairman of the forum, and our topic this evening is really a very different focus from the previous two talks that we've had. And it's on the former slave fort and trading centre at Bunce Island in Sierra Leone. Uh, a country with an absolutely fascinating history and numerous cross Commonwealth and transatlantic links, not least to the UK, the Carolinas and Nova Scotia. So I'm really delighted to be able to introduce our speaker this evening, uh, Isatu Smith, who will be joining us, well, is here already <laughs> on screen, uh, internet permitting for cross, cross fingers, um, but it should be okay, live from Freetown. And we're extremely fortunate, really, to have Isa to speak to us this evening. She's an immensely experienced professional, That's conservation really professional, happening. and she's worked in the culture and heritage sectors of the country for over 25 years. And for five years, between 2014 and 2019, she was the chair of the Monuments and Relics Commission of Sierra Leone, so hugely uh, well-placed to talk about these issues. Currently, she's the Managing Director of the West Africa Heritage Consultancy, the sort of premier heritage uh, consultancy in the country. Uh, also a trustee of the West Africa Shared Cultural Heritage Trust and an international advisory board member of the International African American Museum in Charleston in South Carolina. So we're, we're delighted, Isotope, to, to welcome you today. But what's particularly relevant, I think, for this evening's talk is that in addition to all of that, she was the consultant project manager for the Bunce Island Preservation Project, which was facilitated by the World Monuments Fund. I'm sure she'll tell us a lot more about that shortly. The usual um, uh, housekeeping points apply. Uh, the talk will last for about 40 to 45 minutes, after which we'll open it up for uh, Q&As. There are a chance for uh, observations and comments from people at that stage. And you can submit Q&As at any stage in the, in the chat box throughout the talk. So um, just a few housekeeping points. Um, keep your sound mute, please, your camera off, and select speaker view to follow the actual presentation. And for those of you who are interested, just so you're aware, the talk will be recorded and available uh, afterwards. So really, that's all I wanted to say. And without further delay, Isatu, really over to you. Thank you very much, Philip, for that introduction. I'm very pleased to be here. I'd like to thank the Commonwealth Heritage Forum for hosting me today. And then um, I'd like to thank the audience for joining in. I will go straight into my presentation and I'm just gonna share my screen with you all. Um, there. Like Philip said, I'll be talking about Bones Island which was a British slave fort in Sierra Leone. And then um, before I, I like to, first of all, dedicate this talk to Mr. Anthony John Steele. Tony was a, a master stonemason and conservator, and he led the work on, on Bones Island. Tony had over 50 years experience conserving historic structures, including in Africa, but he sadly passed away in Freetown in March, 2019, whilst actually working on the Bones Island project. So may his soul rest in peace. Tony, of course, was working with the World Monument Fund and he will be sorely missed. We do appreciate the work he did in Sierra Leone. I'll be talking about Bones Island's history and its use as a slave port. I'll also be talking about his connection to the United States. And I'll talk about the Bones Island Preservation Project that the World Monument Fund implemented in Freetown. And time permitting, I'll talk about Freetown, a little bit, just a brief history, and I'll share some slides about some historic buildings and um, to showcase some of our Commonwealth heritage at risk in, in, in Freetown. Now, Bones Island is located in in, in, in Sierra Leone, and um, it was a slave castle located about 17 miles upriver 
in the Sierra Leone estuary. And the Sierra Leone estuary, the Sierra Leone Harbor, is the largest natural harbor in Africa and is the third largest in the world. People are also wonder why the traders located Burns Island on this very tiny island right into the harbor. And the reasons are twofold, mainly because Burns Island is at the limit of navigation, it was easy to defend. The first fort was located on Tasso Island, which is this island here, which is the largest island in the harbor. But as you can see, Tasso is surrounded by deep water all around. And the first fort was actually attacked in 1664 by Admiral de Reuter. The traders therefore decided to move their fort to Bons Island, which is this tiny island here. And Bons is at the limit of navigation. When attacked, the traders could flee from the Up River Beach and flee to an, a friendly African village in, in the Rotumba, the back here, and sit out, wait out the attack, and then return and rebuild their, their fort. Also, because Bons Island is just five miles from the mouth of the two main rivers that empty into the estuary, the Potlocko Creek and the, the Roken, Roken River, the main motto and um, means of transportation during the slave trading days, the traders on Bons Island therefore had first peak of captives and goods coming down the coast from the interior. So for trade advantage reasons, it was also um, um, very um, 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 fortunate that the traders located their, 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 their fort on Bons Island. Now, this is, a, this is a topographical map of Bones Island. As you can see, it is a very tiny island. It is just 1,600 feet long and 350 feet wide. And the fort is built on the north end of the island. And you have the cemeteries, like kind of in the middle of the fort. And the African village was right here, somewhere between the cemeteries and the, and the fort itself. Um, the, the African village was, was called Adam's Town, named after the last African foreman by Adam, and when he was called Adam, later on he became by Adam. Satya, can you just speak up slightly, just speak up a little bit louder. Yeah. So, Bones Island was operated from 1670 till 1808 by four British farms. The first one was the Gambia Adventurers and then the Royal African Company of England. And then there was a break and then another private company and a private company took it up, Grant Oswald and Company, and then the company, the farm of John and Alexander Anderson who were nephews of Richard Oswald. The only period was characterized by very poor management, high staff turnover, high mortality rates due to malaria and yellow fever, low volume of trade, and low profit margins. These two early companies, the Gambia Adventure and the Royal African Company of England, were subsidized by the Crown, and they were meant mainly to have the British maintain the presence on the coast. They were given monopolies, trade on this part of Africa, and the operations were, like I said, was not profitable, and it was not a sound business venture. The two companies that operated it in its later period, the Grant Oswald and Sargent, and the John and Alexander Anderson, were privately owned, they were well managed, they hired more dependable staff, often family members, but more importantly, they maintained a large African workforce who were highly trained in carpentry, ships building, masonry, blacksmithery, to name a few. This period was very profitable with very high volume of trade. The island is named Bons Island today, but it was originally called Benz Island, and it was named after a Captain John Benz, an officer of both the Gambia Adventurers and the Royal African Company of England. The island was called first spelled in, in B E N S E after Captain John Benz, and then later B E N C E. It only became known as Bones Island after it was no longer used as a slave fort. And that is because there's a Bones River close by, 
And I think that's what led to them corrupting the name Bounce Island to Bones Island. Now, it is estimated that around 30,000 captives passed through Bones Island's gates while it was in operation. The majority of Bones Island's captives were sent to the West Indies and, in, and other North American um, um, colonies, but a significant majority were sent to the North American colonies of South Carolina and Georgia and later Florida. Now, this is very important as we will find out later because of this the, the, the legacies of this slave trade. Now, like I said, the first fort was built on Tasso Island, but it was attacked by um, Admiral De Reuter in 1664, and the traders therefore moved their fort to Bones Island. Now, Bones Island was leased by the traders from the African king by Sama, and also other islands in the harbor were leased that were used to grow citrus and rice to service the, the slaves or the captives. The king by Sama was paid an annual rent and he was also paid custom duties on goods and captives that were traded on the island. There were two workforces on Bones Island, a white workforce and, a, and an African workforce. And the African workforce was led by a foreman who reported directly to the chief agent. The, the, excuse me, at one point, a visitor, Curry, Joseph Curry, counted as many as 600 free African workers who were involved in various trades on Bones Island. The picture on your screen shows the, um, the trading area looking from, um, you're looking at the merchant's um, quarters, but outside of the merchant quarters, right around here, is the, is the trade, trading area. Now, cash, there were three main types of trading that were done on Bones Island. Castle trade, sloop trade, and out factory trade. Castle trading was done at the fort itself with African traders bringing their captives and goods during the dry season, that is April to October, down the two main rivers from the back of Bones Island. Sloop trade refers to, to the small single masted coasting vessels that were used to conduct trade along the Atlantic coast and that were used to fetch captives and trade goods from the various out factory posts that were stationed at the mouth of the major rivers that emptied into the, into the Atlantic. That leads us into the third form of trading, out factory trade, which refers to the extensive network of trading posts or out factories located at the mouth of the rivers patrolled by the castle troops where agents or factors of the Bones Island traders were stationed. This further widens the reach of the traders on Bones Island. So Bones Island was thus was a base for the wide reaching operations of the traders, but all trading was done by a better exchange system. Now the trade goods included guns, gunpowder, clothing items, metal goods, axes like um, swords, axes, knives, al alcoholic drink like rum, wine, brandy, cider beer, and trinkets like glass beads and gun flints, clay tobacco pipes. And these were all what the African wanted from the West. In exchange, the whites or the slave traders wanted gold, ivory, beeswax, cowhides, camels, as well as captives from the interior of Africa. This next slide shows the outside of the fortification wall of the fort itself. And at its highest, this wall rises to 40 feet. Traders would assemble outside this fortification wall at the trading area where traders from the interior would bring their captives and trade goods and meet up with traders from the West who will have their Western trade goods for exchange. Arriving at the fort, the captives were examined like cattle with their eyes 
their mouths, their teeth examined. They were made to jump up and down to check their fitness. And during the early period of the fourth history, they were even branded with hot branding irons. The captives would have been kidnapped during slave raids or sold off to pay off debt or as casualties of inter-clan wars. They would have witnessed their loved ones being killed. They would have been traumatized and forced to walk long distances, often carrying heavy loads on their heads and chained to other captives. They would have been bought and sold a number of times by various middlemen also. They would have been truly traumatized by the time they got to Bons Island. On top of that, they were being treated like cattle and the poor captives believed that they would be slaughtered and eaten just like they used to kill their cows. As a result, most of them, some of them became very traumatized and they developed a condition known as the lethargy. They became catatonic. When you develop that condition, they refuse to eat or sleep and a number of them died. In the later years, colored strings were tied around their wrists instead of branding to tag them as coming from Sierra Leone, which is a rice coast country. Later, I will talk about the significance of tagging captives from Sierra Leone and especially from the rice coast. This is the main entrance into the fort. It had two big wooden doors that opened outward and it also had a security post on top, crashed on top of the gate tower with windows looking out to the south for traders coming from the interior and to the west for traders coming from, from the west. The, the traders, the, the, the captives and goods brought by, bought by the Bones Island traders will be brought into this gateway and sorted out into the trade, into the certain area, which I will show you in the minutes. The goods will be stored in either a strong room if they were valuables like gold and ivory, or on the ground floors of the merchant dormitory here, and another building inside the fort, which was a strong room, and also the top floor of a gunpowder magazine. Of course, the gunpowder and all explosives were kept in the gunpowder magazine, and the top floor of the gunpowder magazine was also used as a, as a store. Now, the, the male slaves, after being sorted out, the male captives, would be held in this open-aired slave yard, which is directly, this is the back elevation of the Barnes house. The open-aired male slave yard is directly behind Barnes house, and this is where the male captives would, would have been held. And trading was done in the dry season, so wooden huts were built to offer some protection from the sun. Now, the, slave, the, 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 the traders usually preferred young men between the ages of 14 or 15 and 30 years old. These were chained to each other and they were, as I already said, they were housed in wooden huts built in, the, in this open air slave yard. A British woman, Anna Maria Falcon Bridge, who visited Bonsai in 1791 and had dinner with the traders and looked out of these windows into the slave yard, remarked that she was astonished to look out of the window of one's house into the slave yard to discover about two to 300 male captives chained to each other, eating from troughs of rice placed in their midst. And she contrasted this with the meal, the sumptuous meal that she just had with the, with the traders. And she remarked at the cruelty that she had witnessed. Behind the, the next door, I should say, to the open air male slave yard is the women and children slave yard, which is much smaller. The women and children and children were taken through. There's a connecting door between the male slave yard and the female slave yard, and they were taken through this door into this smaller slave yard. Women and children who were considered strong enough to survive were purchased along with the male captives. When one enters the fort, you come into an opening with a long cotton wall here with semi-circular bastions on either end. And you'll also find these cannons lying along the cotton wall. The, the openings of the, the there were 16 such cannons 
laying around this cutting wall originally with four in each semicircular bastion. The four in, the ba four in each bastion were closed up when inner walls were pulled in and the cannons taken away. But these eight cannons survive and they are still at Bonds Island today. Bonds had an interesting military history. As long as we're looking at the cannons, let me just briefly touch on that. French naval forces attacked Bonds Island a total of four times. It was attacked during the war of the League of Osborne in 1694, the war of the Spanish succession in 1704, the American Revolutionary War in 1779, and the French Revolutionary War in 1794. The French destroyed the castle during, during all these attacks, and the British soldiers returned each time to rebuild their fortifications and their warehouses. The traders were not soldiers and so could not defend themselves. They used these cannons when attacked only to hold off the attackers long enough for them to gather their valuables and flee from the back of the fort to a friendly African village and will only return after the attack has left. Pirates also attacked Bones Island in 1719 and in 1720 during what some have called the golden age of piracy. Thus, the current winds are of the fifth or sixth port as historical drawings of the fort shows. And these are historical drawings of the fort. You can see that the design changes over time. And this is the last fort that was built after the 1794 attack. The current winds are of this fort. Of course, there are some exaggerations on this design because these situations are not, were not present, but it gives you a general idea of what the fort looks like. Now, going back to this cannon, after the 1794 attack, new cannons were brought in. And these, as you can see, bear the, bear the, bear the insignia of King George III. You can see the three right here, and the G and the R for Rex. So they were brought in during the reign of King George III. This is Barnes House, as it looks before the presentation project that we did. I'm using the old photographs in my, this um, phase, um, portion of my talk, and I, I will showcase what the, the post looks like now after the preservation work that we've just done. Barnes House was built in the tropical Georgian style with an elevated covered veranda you can see the roof that supported the veranda. And the veranda was wrapped around all three sides of the building in a rectangular pattern. Barnes House was very well kept and elegant, and it resembled plantation houses in the West Indies and wealthy homes in the South Carolinas. It even had a fake fireplace. You can see it right here. Although no fires were lit because we are in the tropic, where, which as you all know is very hot. Now, this was the office tower, and this is where all clerical work were done. I have to say that the ground floor of Barnes House was where the chief agent and his senior ranking officers had their office space, and they resided on the top floor of this building. This was a three-story building, and this is where all clerical dispatches were done, all accounting work. And next to it, you can see it from this picture, but next to it this is the kitchen and forge area where all cooking was done and where the blacksmith work was done. All the shackles were manufactured in the, in the blacksmith forge. Now, the, the next few slides, we'll talk about Dr. Ismo. Before I talk about Dr. Ismo, let me state that. In the 1700s, the call for the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade were gaining momentum. And finally, by 1807, the transatlantic slave trade was abolished by the British Parliament. By this time, Sierra Leone had already free time had been established as a settlement for free slaves. And this settlement was just downriver from Bones Island. Royal Navy forces had been stationed on, in Freetown to enforce the anti transatlantic slave um, act, and it was almost impossible for the traders on Bones Island to continue their act. 
They attempted to convert the forts to various other uses, but none of them were as successful as slave trading. By 1840, the fort was finally abandoned until the early 1940s, when it was rediscovered by Dr. Eastman. Dr. Eastman was an, um, a British Sierra Leonean medical doctor, but he was an avid amateur historian. He led workers from the public works department in the, in the, in the new British colony of Sierra Leone, and they went to Bones Island and cleared off the vegetation, which had taken over the fort. He also had these black and white photographs taken, and you can see that by the 1950s, Bones Island had been overgrown by vegetation. You can see the big, huge trees growing on walls. You can see that the walls were covered with trees and everything. You can see that some of the structures had collapsed. But the good thing that Dr. That Eastman did, in addition to taking these photographs, was that he had a model of the fort made as it looks like in the 1950s. As you can see, the, the strong room by then was intact. This is where valuables were kept. The upstairs part of the, the, the upstairs floor of Barnes House was still intact. Barnes is a two story structure, part of it was still intact. And you can see the cannons line, even the bastions were not. Um, and disintegrating as they were before we did the preservation work. The South Bastion was intact. And you can see that much of the, you can see that the, the office tower had, uh, its, its, ground, its ground floor walls were still there. This is the kitchen and forge area that I, that I, I mentioned. Now, Dr. through the work of Dr. Eastman, Barnes Island, was again reintroduced into poor people's memories. You can imagine after almost 100 years of being abandoned, um, it had faded from people's memories. Although the older folks in neighboring communities still remember that it was used for slave trading, and these accounts were passed down in oral traditions from generation to generation. But for the most part, the younger generation had no recollection of what Bones Island looks like. So through Dr. Eastman's work, Bones Island was named as the country's first national monument. And Dr. Eastman used to take regular trips out there to spend weekends and to study the island further. But the secrets of Bones Island will not be unraveled until the 1970s through the work of these two Americans, Joe Opala here and Christopher DeCoss. Joe Opala is an anthropologist and a public historian and Professor Dikos, who is Dikos, is an archaeologist. Through their research, we now know more about the unique relationship that Bones, Bones Island had with especially South Carolina and Georgia and Florida. We, through the work of Christopher Dikos, you know, he, when we were able to, you know, he's been able to collect a lot of the surface artifacts and clean them, record them, and try to analyze them. So through the work of these two gentlemen, we now know more about Bones Island than we did when Dr. Eastman rediscovered it in the 1940s to 50s. Now, what Joe Opala's research revealed is that plantation owners, excuse me, through his research, he revealed that plantation owners had experimented with traditional crops like cotton and sugar cane in the British colonies of South Carolina and Georgia and later Florida. Unfortunately, these crops, um, cotton and sugar cane did not do well in these colonies. However, rice, it was discovered, did extremely well. The problem was that the planters were not very knowledgeable about rice cultivation, but they knew from accounts of earlier travelers to Africa, that along what was called the rice coast of West Africa, where Africans who had been cultivating rice for centuries. They therefore turned their attention to this part of Africa, which led to an increase in the demand for captives from this area. The rice coast of West Africa was the region between what is now Senegal and the Gambia in the north, and Sierra Leone and Liberia in the, in the, in the south. Now, 
Both Island Fort, because we built through the Central Palace Wharf, was owned by Oswald and Company by this time. By the mid 1700s, the rice economies in South Carolina and Georgia were emerging. And in um, Sierra Leone, Ross Island was owned by these private partners. And because of the huge increase in demand for captives from the rice schools, this led to an increase in the volume of trading from Bones Island. Richard Oswald, who was the principal owner of Bones Island at that time, had formed a business relationship with an American plantation owner and slave trader, Henry Lawrence, who was based in Charleston, South Carolina. Lawrence indicated to Oswald that captains with bright growing skills were fetching higher prices. This led to a huge increase, like I said, in demand. And this also meant that the traders on Bones Island had a ready partner in Lawrence, in Henry, in Henry Lawrence in South Carolina. And this led to direct trading between Bones Island and Charleston. Thus, Henry Lawrence receive captives and trade goods from Bones Island. They will advertise them, as you can see from these posters, um, um, highlighting the fact that the captives were from Bones Island with a culture of rice. They knew how to grow rice and that they came from Bones Island. And he will advertise them on posters such as this, and he will sell them. There are several posters that spoke about Sierra Leone, which is a rice country from West Africa. Another poster that also speaks about 96 healthy new Negroes, of which men and women and boys were, were among them. And they came from Bounce Island. Also talking about rice, you know, and this was always highlighted in the posters to ensure that these captives fetch higher prices than normal. This is Henry Lawrence, who was the business partner of Richard Oswald. And Lawrence, like I said, was based in Charleston, South Carolina. This is, this is Richard Oswald, who was British and principal owner of Bones Island by the mid 1700s. The relationship between Oswald and Lawrence developed into a friendship and later, when both of them ventured into policy, they would represent their various countries, their respective countries, at the Treaty of Paris. Even this here, you can see them both. Oswald representing Britain, and Henry Lawrence representing, well, what is now the United States, but it wasn't called the United States at that time. But they were both present at the Treaty of Paris and they helped to negotiate American independence. So we like to say that American independence was partly negotiated by the owner, co-owner of Bones Island and his Charleston counterpart business party. Now, you can imagine such forced migration of a large group of people from a particular place like Bones Island, Sierra Leone, to Charleston, South Carolina, would give rise to a large descendant group in the diaspora. Due to a particular twist of fate, the Rice Coast Africans did not only take along their rice growing skills, they also took along malaria and yellow fever, and a few other, and a few mosquitoes managed to go along the holes of slave ships. The disease bearing mosquitoes thrived in the semi tropical climate of the low country, the swampy area along the coastline of South Carolina and Georgia. Mosquitoes proliferated as more and more plantations were opened up, and they were breeding in the shallow, slow moving waters of the rice fields and spreading malaria and yellow fever. As a result, the white man's grave, that Sierra was known as, was transported to the rice plantations of South Carolina and Georgia. Whites started dying in huge numbers with the Africans having some immunity when thus they were not dying as, as quickly as the whites were. Thus, white plantation owners fled from their plantations, leaving black poor men in charge. This meant that 
the African captives were left much to their own devices with little interaction with whites. They were therefore able to retain much of their history, heritage, and culture. Today, descendants of these West Coast Africans are known as the Gullahs or Gitches, and most still reside in the Sea Islands in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia where their ancestors were enslaved. There are a great number of Africanisms found in their language, food ways, names, traditions, and so much more. They also still eat rice a lot, as well as okra and other such food items, just like we still do in Sierra Leone and other rice schools countries. The connection between the connection between these scholars and Sierra Leoneans in particular is very well known and documented. And there has been a number of visits exchanged between these two people. The most notable of these was a visit by the former president, Joseph Saidu Momo, when he visited the Penn Center in South Carolina and Georgia. This is just a brief history of Bonus Island because I want to move on into the preservation work that we did and I see that we don't even have much time for that. Now, following the work in the 1970s and later on 1980s and 90s that Joseph Kupala did, a lot of public interest was generated in Bonds Island, but also there were calls for its preservation. After several attempts by various parties to have the fort preserved, um, in, in varying degrees of success, I, I must say. Um, in 2016, the Monuments and Relics Commission, by then I was the chairman of the commission. We were successful in getting the site, first of all, onto the World Monuments Fund's watch list. And we, thought we had a partnership developed with the World Monuments Fund to apply for funds for its preservation. So as you can see from the screen, um, we were able to get funding from the United States Ambassador's Fund for Cultural Preservation. The um, um, grant was made to the World Monuments Fund and the project was jointly implemented by the World Monuments Fund and the Monuments and Relics Commission of Sierra Leone. You know, the award was made in 2017 and due to some delays, the project got on the way in 2019. The main objective of the, of the projects were to stabilize the standing ruins, site interpretation and improvement of the of facilities, education outreach and training of local craft people and community engagement. Stabilization of, this, of the ruins. This was done in phases and because there was so much damage to the fort, we had to prioritize. I have to say that um, the team that led and implemented the work. And I, I think some members of the team are present in the audience. Um, it was led by Stevie Batu, who's the senior program director of the World Monuments Fund. Melbourne Gamma was, Gaba was a structural engineer. He led to the steel, was the lead conservator of Master Stone Mason. Christopher Dikos was the lead um, archeologist with Boss Mamori as a rescue archeologist. And Babatunde Karim, was the botanist with Desmond Jones acting as site for man, he was a civil engineer. The work was guided by assessment and analysis that had been done previously, such as initial condition assessment, archeological assessments, historical um, analysis and stuff like, like that. So uh, a general conservation, um, a general management plan had been developed by Christopher Dikos and his team and so we still developed a conservation plan. Like I said, the work was divided into phases with phase one being work done on the South Bastion of the fort itself. As you can see, the South Bastion and the cutting wall, they were the most pressing, and they, they, they were the most badly damaged part of the fort, but this is also the area of the fort with substantial standing ruins. There are two parts of the wall, the South Bastion, one at the defensive tower, the cutting wall, which I showed where they cut the cannons are. A significant section of the Bastion and cutting wall is built on made up ground, comprising loosely of compacted soil and rock, and thus prone to instability. 
Now, if the, um, because of um, this, the soil that was put in between the outer wall and the inner wall of the bastion had been exerting some pressure on the wall, and that actually, by the time we got to work, this wall had collapsed completely. This is bracing that was put on by earlier intervention and in 2017. The walls were poorly constructed, with loose and compacted, in field between the inner and outer skins of the stone wall, made of block or rubble, or a combination of, of both. This led to slow but consistent collapse and rotation and division of the wall into frag fragments. Thus, the objective of the repair work was to establish structural continuity between the textures of fractured and rotating masonry, reconnecting them so that they work again together. In addition, the fragments have been restrained from further outward, they needed to be restrained from further outward, outward rotation. So this, of course, this is what the South Bastion looked like before and during stabilization work. This is what it looked like after. But then you can, this is the work that was actually done inside the South Bastion. A radial beam was constructed and restraint of the outer rotation of the wall was achieved by connecting the radial beam to a large enforced concrete anchor. The solid filling the spaces between the outer and inner walls was removed under archaeological supervision, which we had throughout the implementation of the, of the project, but it was put back after the work was done. This is what the finished um, South Bastion looked like after the radial beam and anchor had been, had been put in. A significant amount of work was completed along the rest of the cutting wall and at the South Bastion. The fractures were cleaned and in fact they were cleaned and um, we were cleaned of debris and filled and grouted. The top of the wall was capped as you can see here with stones to prevent further water damage. The next phase of work was Barnes, Barnes House. Barnes House is the most iconic structure at the site and it, it is at the core of the complex. It was built using bricks and it was bricks that almost certainly came from Britain brought out as ballast. The bricks were loose, trees covered walls, and moisture and decay was very well advanced, and the walls were covered with centuries of decay. Work commenced with removal of all soil and organic material from the wall surface and voids. Voids and cavities created by rotted timbers were then filled with textured brick to establish structural continuity. All structural fractures were replaced. This is the interior of, of Bans House. All structural structures were packed with Portland cement mortar. Historic lime, lime renders were carefully cleaned. And I'll just go down. We are carefully cleaned here using a Dove steam cleaner. And some portions were cleaned by hand by female workers. Tony used to say that they are the, they are the gentle touch. So, as, so you can see that this is the interior of Barnes House before and after work was done. This is the southern elevation of Barnes House before and after stabilization work was done. This is the back elevation of Barnes House. This is the slave yard. This is before and after stabilization work was done. Trees that grew on walls were carefully removed from Barnes House and other areas of the uh, fort. The next structure that was worked on was the gate tower. Like I already said, this is the main entrance into the fort, into and out of the fort, and it is connected to a roadway that leads to the jetty down which captives were marched on their journey west for a life of certain death or slavery. But it was in a really bad shape. Fractures had, in fact, the, the, the gate tower had like this, this connected from the merchant's quarters here. And then there was a big tree growing on top of this wall here. So the tree was carefully removed, followed by grouting, reconstruction of the door jams, and repointing of stonework. Small sections of missing masonry were rebuilt. 
where we, we built, as you can see here, where we built to increase stability. Finally, the original arch, this one here over the opening was restored because the arch provides lateral bracing support for the walls on either side of the building. The next structure that was worked on was the, was the merchant's dormitory. And just like the other structures, the um, trees were removed. Oops, we are cleaned off with the dove cleaner and also by hand. All remaining organic material were all were removed and the wall head was capped with mortar and stones. Work also took place. But this is work also took place in a, in window openings, many of which were in very poor condition with missing stones and widespread decay of surrounding masonry. The next structure worked on was the office tower. The office tower, this was the only three-story structure on the island, and this is where all clerical work was done. As you can see, by the time we got to work, this wall had collapsed, and there was a big fracture running down the length of the, of the remaining surviving wall. It's single, just a single two-story wall. This wall here remained standing on top of the foundations, which was unsupported and severely fractured, as you can see here. A reinforced concrete beam was cast around the top of the foundations using a mixture of white cement and open sea as binder. The large fracture, this large fracture here, was packed with bricks and mortar, substantially increasing friction between its two parts. The office tower remains vulnerable, but these interventions should ensure it stands for the foreseeable future. Another key component of the intervention was site presentation. And during this phase, we did some work on the jetty. There, actually, there was no jetty originally. It was, there was just the, this old concrete, big concrete slab that was dumped there by uh, an old mining company in the 15. And this was used as a jetty for we got to work. Now, the, one of the biggest obstacles for visitors to the island was getting from and on board boats, especially at low tide when the boats must move off the beach. Visitors had to either wade through the mud or accept a lift on the shoulders of one of the stronger boatmen. The only thing that was serving as a jetty, like I said, was this huge concrete slab that had been dumped there. So the government agreed to fund the construction of this jet jetty as a show of support for the, for the, for the restoration project. Thus, a floating jetty was built. It has this concrete dock and wooden floating pontoon, which rises and falls with low and high, and high tide. So it is now safe for people to access the island. Another key component of enhancing visitor experience was the laying, the mapping out of visitor routes and trails were put in using bricks that were recovered from some of the structures on the island under archeological supervision. These trails were laid out, as well as these steps were put on the very steep portions of the island to facilitate easy touring of the sites by visitors. Additionally, there have been long running complaints of there have not been toilets on the island. A toilet was built and the former caretaker's house was converted into a visitor center. Another important component of the preservation project that the World Monument Fund and the Monuments and Islands Commission did. Of course, this is rescue archaeology I've already mentioned. There was always rescue archaeologists at hand during the entire implementation of the project. A key component was the training and education outreach components of the program. An education outreach program was implemented by the Monument and Wellness Commission. This 133 students from 10 school heritage clubs visited the island. These visits were funded by the World Monument Fund using project funds. Also, 
also new. Also 51, local craftspeople were hired and trained in various crafts of which eight of them were women. We saw the women cleaning the walls by hand. They did the delicate stuff around the court. But it is very rare for women to be involved in this type of work in Sierra Leone. And we are very proud that women stepped forward and offered to be part of the workforce. Also four tour guides were trained as professional tour guides to give tour of Bronx Island. Through a partnership between the World Monuments Fund and Columbia University, 11 grad students from Columbia University in New York partnered with 13 students from Fabi College here in, in Freetown, and they engaged in a studio field trip, which was funded again by World Monuments Fund um, because of the partnership that, that they had. There was extensive community engagement before during and even after the implementation of the, the project. This is because there's intense rivalry among the communities surrounding Bones Island, each where wanted more um, benefits from the project, but we were able to maintain a fine balance by hiring community members from all the communities that surround Bones Island. And I have to say that um, in, in, in developing the project, these communities were consulted and their input were reflect, reflected in the overall design of the project. Overall, I have to say that this was a very fulfilling project and we scored huge successes. Now, um, I only have four seconds from the time. I'm just gonna walk you quickly through um, um, images of Freetown which is a, a city of rich cultural heritage and a unique history. And then um, it was established um, by various group of settlers, the first of which were the Black Poor from England, and then the Nova Scotia settlers who were actually Black loyalists from South Carolina and, and other um, slave colonies in America. The Maroons who came from Jamaica to Nova Scotia, the Western Africans who were Africans captured after the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade other groups that came along. Now this is a uh, view of Freetown when you are, are put from the sea and uh, these are some historic and um, important historic buildings that are at risk. This is the Law Courts building. This is a, a historic clock tower at eastern of Freetown and this is the same clock tower that was badly restored. This is St. Charles Church which is the first stone church built in West Africa. This is Maroon Church that was built by the Maroons from Jamaica. And this is the former CMS Grammar School from Boys at Regent Square. And this is a historic lighthouse. And this um, lighthouse is very important to Bones Island because the traders at Bones had actually leased this land and had stationed their free workers who used to light bonfires to warn passing ships of rocks close by and also used to guide ships up river to Bones Island. So that bonfire will be put into this lighthouse. These are colonial residences that were built to house colonial officials in Freetown. And as you can see, most of them are in a terrible state of conservation. They are found at Hill Station and they are heritage at least. This is another one, another one. And these are the historic Creole board houses. If you've heard about the board houses, people listening and watching from the Caribbean to be familiar with this type of architecture because this was actually brought along by the Maroons and other influences from the Southern and, and states of the modern day America. This is a two story board house in Freetown, a three story board house. And this is the historic Fabi College, old Fabi College building. This was established in 1827 as the first institution of Western learning in Sub-Saharan Africa. Its first principal was born in Charleston, South Carolina. The most early West African colonial Af um, officers attended this college, and this college helped establish Freetown as the Athens of West Africa. As you can see, it is damaged, and we are in the process of trying to secure funds for its preservation. This is not in Freetown, but it is connected to all to Fabi College because during the war, World War II, Fabi College was evacuated and the sought refuge at this structure here. This is Maban College, which was 
constructed using funding by private individual, Samuel Benjamin Abuke Thomas, and it was set up as an agricultural institute to train male natives of the colony. Construction was completed in 1912, but I doubt it, it was not actually used as a college and it very soon fell into disrepair. This is what it looked like when it was constructed. And this is what it pretty much looks like today. It is in ruins, but it's a magnificent building. And Melbom Gaba, who is listening, is very much interested in this building. And we are trying to wrap our hands around to find ways to restore, preserve this building. This is Baban College also. This is what it looks like today. You can see grass has taken over the, the in, in compound and on. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, um, this is my presentation. I've left out a lot of information, but um, during question and answer, I hope I'll be able to give a little more information. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you once more to the Commonwealth Heritage Forum for hosting me today. And thank you to the audience for listening. Isitu, thank you very much indeed for what I think was just a wonderful talk across the whole spectrum of uh, the history of uh, not Spunce Island, but touching on the wider history of Sierra Leone. I mean, I was just keeping an eye on the, the chat box as you were talking, and there was a sort of blizzard of comments going on uh, between people and um, some issues that were being raised as well. Uh, so can we just throw it open now for anyone who wants to ask uh, any questions? Um, to put to IC2 or, or others. Any questions? Ah, Dora, yeah. I said to thank you. That was absolutely fantastic. Really, really brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, you could have done another hour <laughs> as far as I was concerned. Um, but what can we do to help? Um, I mean, that last um, college, Mabang College? Mabang, Mabang I mean, College. I mean, I, I last went to Sierra Leone, it must be about 25, 30 years ago, a long, long time ago. And even in Freetown, there's a thing called Cotton Tree, there's a, and then there's a big sort of a wooden building where they've got all these artifacts in i mean we should be trying to save those things How, what can we do to help you and and um um uh, you know um the people that are working with you uh, mr garber melbourne for example you know well um there is the monuments and relish commission which is the government agency they have the primary responsibility of um, protecting, promoting, and preserving all um, objects of historical, archaeological, yeah. cultural interest in Sierra Leone. And yeah. um, um, so that, that should be your first port of call. But um, I mean, from a private individual perspective, um, I have to say that it is not very well organized yeah. from a private perspective. Um, but um, to the West Africa Heritage Consultancy that we have set up with Melbourne and others, we are trying to fill in this gap between what the government can do and what the private sector can do. So we are actually in the process of identifying um, um, assets that are worthy of, worthy of being preserved yeah. and partnering with other agencies to get funding for the preservation. Unfortunately, in Sierra Leone, there is very limited expertise in preservation work. You know, and also the government has, uh, until recently, the government had not prioritized um, um, preservation of these assets. And um, there was very minimal funding that was made to the Monuments and Relics Commission. So there are various issues that are, that have prevented effective preservation of these assets. Well, like, like I say, increasingly more private individuals are showing interest and we hope to work with different groups to see how we can fill in this gap to try to save these assets. Well, I mean, I didn't write down what you said, but I mean, I mean, if you had a crowdfunder, for example, you know, you mentioned one of the things that you've set up, you and Melbourne set up, if you set that up and have a crowdfunder, go online, I'm sure you'll get a lot of support. I'm sure you will. Um, so that's just an idea I, I throw out there to you, you know? Yeah, well, um, we will um, let the, the Monuments and Elites Commission, as I said, they are the, the primary agency that's uh, in charge of these and preservation work, but also, like you say, private individuals are also um, allowed to come together and pull their resources together for this, especially like the old Fabric College building. It has a wide, it has a wide alumni. You know, even people who attended 
for people like that Mount Owe, like myself, we have a vested interest in saving yeah. that yeah. building. So I can see a crowdfunding effort for that building be very successful. Okay. I can see in the chat somebody Rosie sent set a, a link that is that the link to what you're referring to yeah, the committee as well sorry there's a question from Miranda which she asked earlier sorry to interrupt you Dora um, about oral histories relating to Bunce Island have they been mm -hmm. recorded or published are they are they published well um, most of them are captured in Joseph Pala's work because he did interview the surrounding community extensively, whatever oral history that was um, available, Joe recorded it. So if you um, read Joe's work, you will see a reflection of the oral history from this surrounding community, especially about Bone Island. Great, thank you so much. What what sort of things do they do they say? Oh, they they um well first of all they call Bone Island Ben Ben Sally, which is you know, it was called Ben's Island. So they actually called the island by its proper name. It was never Ben's Island, it was always Ben's Island. So the older folks still refer to it as Ben Sally. So they will say that was Ben Sally and either my great 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 grandfather used to work there. What happened, the, the free African workforce after um, um, the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade and after the port was abandoned, the free African workers actually rioted because they were not getting paid and everything. The new governor, the governor of the new colony of free turned out to send a contingent of police in to quell the riots and they were asked to leave the island. So they, they were given refuge by an, an African king at a place called Medina, which is very close to Bons Island. So the surrounding communities surrounding Bons Island are actually most of them are actually descendants of these free African workers who used to work here. So they have these memories and oral traditions that are being handed down from their grandparents and great grandparents who either worked on the island or whose parents worked on the island. So in that regard, they know about the, their connection to the island, you know, but just that they've not experienced them themselves. Mm. Yeah, so it'd be, it'd be really interesting to hear, hear more about that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I think it's a kind of history that sometimes doesn't get included in, in the narrative. So if mod, if historians are writing about it now, which name do you think they should call the island in when, in written work? Well, it is it, it is called Bones Island now, but its original name was Ben's Island. If you say Bones, yeah. Ben's Island, nobody will know it. So it, it is Bones Island, and I think we have it is now Bones Island in the history books. It was you know, that's the name that is in the national register. Right, okay. There's a couple of uh, people with their hands up uh, who I think want to ask questions. Uh, Sharon John, um, do you want us to ask something? Well, I also had a question from Catherine Leonard, if Catherine's there. She asked a really nice question about um, the plans for the future of Bunce Island and how you plan to tell this difficult, important story, how you're Can working. We get Sharon first, because I think you were trying to speak, um, but it's very faint. Yeah, that's because um, I hadn't unmuted myself. <laughs> right, so, right. It was even more than faint, I'm afraid. Yeah, the question I was going to ask, I said to, I said to thank you. Dear, thank oh. you for your work. May God bless you now, dear. I, I'm glad you will now they work for you. Mm. So the question I wanted to ask was about security for the island, because, you know, the okay. last times I was there, it was mm. just basically a free-for-all. Anyone could okay. pick up and have picnics and yeah. whatnot. Um, so that was yeah. one question. The other mm -hmm. thing was going to be, in, the last time I was in Freetown, I went to um, the museum and mm -hmm. there had been some good attempts made at, you know, preserving heritage, but it was still mm -hmm. rather heartbreaking. And mm -hmm. I just wondered if there had been, I know it's been very difficult with COVID and what have you, but if there's been any kind of progress with that, if there's any outside funding or outside connections other than Joe Apala, and his colleagues. And the last one was going to be about um, Frabe College building in Kleintown. I know we were taught growing up that it was made, that the wood that was used was from the ships that were recaptured after 1807. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's, it would just be so wonderful. I mean, someone mentioned a, a crowdfunder, of course, you know, there's so many ideas that people have, but it would be heartbreaking for that building to be lost forever because once they go, you know, they can't come back. So yeah, uh, so many questions, but really mainly a lot of gratitude to you. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed listening to you. Very okay, great. So um, when were you last in Sierra Leone? Um, late 2017. 
Okay, so let me start the security on Bon, on bon Island. There has been tremendous improvement in security on Bon Island. Like you said before, there was nobody there, and tourists will show up with Ziploc bags and just pick up surface artifacts and take, yeah. take them away. Um, after we were appointed into office in 2014, one of the first things that we did was to have 24 hour security on Bon Island. So now there is 24 hour security um, um, on, on Bon Island, you know. Um, so you can rest assured that that has been taken care of. With regards to the museum, and we did do some rehabilitation and refurbishment work, whilst I was at the commission, or well, like you said, it was not enough. In fact, we were moving towards trying to get a new building for the National Museum, because the bulk of the collection are in, in storage because of the, there is insufficient in, in, in display space, and we don't have enough display in cases and stuff like that. So you are right that even though we did some work, the museum still um, needs a lot of work done. And your last question about um, old fabric collectability, you are right, the, the, um, um, the roof was made from um, uh, a slave ship that was broken up and what have you. You do know there was a fire and most of those the members are gone. And then uh, we are, like I said, trying to get some funding for its preservation. And then um, this crowdfunding and all that is, is an option that we can look at because I, I too believe that a lot of funds could be raised through this crowdfunding of um, and efforts because there are lots of alumni from, from FBC who have a vested interest in that, in that building. So we are um, in the process of identifying all stakeholders, consulting with them to have their views reflected in the project that we are trying to, to design, very much like what we did with Bones Island. Yeah, right. okay. Thank you. Well, we didn't, are yeah, we ready for it? So thank good, you. Good just, make good normal. just make we know. Thank you. Okay. So. Can I, can I just um, there's the two more I know conscious wants to speak. Well, one is Liz Andrew, um, and the other is Catherine Leonard. So, um, Liz, do you want to speak first? Yeah, Philip. Um, Catherine great. Leonard asked me to to just speak her question for her. Okay. Well, can we follow on after Liz? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid it's a male Liz, though. Liz, <laughs> this is her husband Kennedy at Crookshank. Thank you again for a splendid talk, Mike. Yeah, wonderful. I wanted to ask a sort of follow-up to the theme of the first two questions, that it must be a, a, a difficult balancing act trying to uh, get money where tourists will come, but mainly Western tourists, I suppose, and money for uh, original cultural uh, um, efforts. And I wondered particularly if there was any relic at all uh, in, of course, under undergrowth and the rest now, of the African village that uh, was next to Bunce Island, or indeed related to the African king uh, responsible for receiving the so-called customs duties and the rest. Mm, okay, so north of the African king by, by Sama, I don't know of any relative really by Sama, by Sama, we decided not on Bones Island. In fact, there was this myth that you must never step foot on Bones Island, otherwise the island will sink. So when he will show up for his annual rent and custom duties, he will stay in his boat. There was one instance where he had to go into the fort. He was pulled, his boat was dragged up the roadway into the fort itself. He stayed in the boat the entire time. And after conducting his business, the boat was dragged back down and put into the water. So there, is, there are no relics of by, by Sama Bot of the African village. The last foreman, Adam, there is a, a, a tombstone that was, the, okay, I, I mentioned the cemeteries just in passing, but there is an African cemetery and a, an European cemetery, and there are lots of tombstones in the, especially the European cemetery. In the African cemeteries, there are no grave markers, but in, in 2017, a ground penetrating radar was used, and it was confirmed that that entire area was in fact the cemetery. Now there is only one max African cemetery in the cemetery in the in the in the and it's close to the European cemetery and that is of Adam. Adam was a was a foreman, was an African foreman on the on the island, and he was a ship carpenter. When he died, the proprietors of the island um, ordered an, a, a tombstone brought in from from England, I guess, and placed over his remains. And then the an inscription on it where that this was done in depth of gratitude for his services that he rendered to to them. Now. And um, Christopher, because the archaeologists that I mentioned did some excavation of the Africa area where the African village was. I think that was in 20, 2015 or so. 20, I, no, I'm not too certain of the date, but a lot of artifacts were dug up. 
you know, um, clay pots and stuff like, like that, that's confirmed that in fact that was the African view. So, and then, um, well, yeah, so in, in, in a lot of ex in, 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 in remains of what the captives used to was, you must note that they did not have a lot of um, artifacts to live there in, in the first place. These are very poor people and they must have fled their villages during slave race and sought um, um, employment on, on the village. But what Chris was able to dig up confirmed that that was the location of the African village, that there were lots of poultry and stuff like that that they used to have to, to use in their daily lives. Thank you. Very interesting. I'm conscious of the time moving on, but I mean, uh, uh, Rachel, did you want to ask Catherine's question on her behalf? Yes, it was just about um, the extent to which the sort of local um, diaspora communities are involved, at, you know, in telling the history and, and yeah, what their role is. And I'm sorry, there was some echo. So the, I didn't get that. In terms of the future of Bunce Island, to what extent, sorry, it's my daughter, is the local community involved? Okay, so the, the local community, like I said, they've been involved throughout, you know, and then, um, 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 what we've done to make sure that their involvement is sustainable is we've trained a lot of local craftsmen yes. and we have a database of them. So in future maintenance work of the fort, they, 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 we expect that the Monument and Commission Commission mm -hmm. use these locally trained craftspeople to carry out, out maintenance work. And um, some of them have expressed interest to be trained as store guides, um, although their level of education is, um, wasn't up to par, but we have trained tour guides who, Take people around the, the, the fort. We are in constant um, communication with the surrounding villages, the, the chiefs, the local chiefs, and every event that is held on Bonds Island, they're invited and they will call libation. And so um, we, we held extensive community engagement with them before the, the implementation of the project. And it was clear that they knew about their historical and cultural connection to Bones Island because some of their ancestors are buried on Bones Island. So they have pledged to continue to help protect the island. And then in that regard, they're acting like security in addition to the paid security guys that we have. So they, 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 they are connected to the island. And I guess any future um, projects will um, make sure that they are um, involved and consulted. So you want to start on now? Okay. Um, I'm conscious that time is moving on and we've been monopolising a lot of your time, Eliza, too. Uh, and you've been talking at great length. Uh, is, is, are there any is one final question or shall we wrap up? Well, there was just a practical thing. Do you mind sharing your contact details um, or is there a way that people can contact you? Um, um, yeah. Um, here, let me put it on the, on, the, on the chat. I'll just send my, I'll just send my email. Yeah, just to say there were lots of questions i'm sorry we haven't managed to get to them all it's been brilliant having so much question and dialogue thank you yeah, i'll just put up my email address in the chat box there also you can you can look up um west africa everything consultants on the web, Facebook, LinkedIn. Okay, well, um, Isa too, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating talk, um, uh, which has really engaged everybody. And I'm sure we could have been here for at least another hour talking about some of the issues that were raised, not just in terms of the history of, of the island, but also the restoration work and indeed um, the training aspects uh, that were involved. Um, I mean, it's a huge tribute to everyone involved that, you, that this has been achieved uh, in spite of all of the, uh, the challenges involved. Now, um, it's certainly shone a light, I think, on a much neglected area of shared heritage. Um, and a large number of people, I suspect, outside Sierra Leone have never even heard of Bunce Island. So I hope at least in some small way, this evening's talk has gone uh, some way towards building a much greater understanding of our shared past and also the importance of conserving that physical legacy uh, and what it symbolises and means to people from different communities. So um, a plea to everyone who, who's, who's listened in 
this evening, um, please join the forum and support our work because one of our top priorities is uh, 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 Commonwealth Heritage at Risk program, under which we're developing a series of pilot projects to help save endangered heritage across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And indeed in Sierra Leone, we're actually exploring and developing uh, a potential program with ISA2 and uh, the mayor of Freetown to help identify heritage at risk and prepare a strategic conservation management plan for the city. That's our aspiration. We have some way to go, but um, uh, some encouraging discussions are underway.